Yeah. Let's do one more round. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out on your Thursday summer evening to hear about anti-inflammation. Um, I, I get excited about this topic because I think it's a really hot topic in the news right now and for really good reason. It's something that is affecting each and every one of us all the time whether we're aware of it or not. So we have basically two types of inflammation. So we have acute inflammation which you have when you sprain your ankle or you get a nice sunburn at the lake or you have a cut and then your body goes into repair mode, it's ready to heal, it, uh, you get redness, you get swelling, you get pain, it's very obvious, then it goes away, you get better, you move on. That's not the kind of inflammation that we're worried about right now. We're worried about the chronic inflammation that can happen over days, months, years, accumulates in the body. The signs are way less obvious, although today I'm going to give you some signs that you may be able to um, connect with inflammation. Um, and it's persistent. It leads to severe um, progressive tissue damage and an abundance of inflammatory diseases. <laughs> Move it over this way. So, some symptoms of chronic inflammation, and you can kind of look at these and see if you are experiencing any of these or if you ever have. Chances are pretty good you're in one of those groups. Digestive problems, chronic fatigue, moodiness, depression, food cravings, insulin resistance, blood sugar issues, weight gain, headaches, allergies, could also be weight loss, kind of unexplained things that are happening in the body. So sometimes we think, well, I just have a headache. It's because, um, you know, you can you point it to something, but you don't necessarily think this might be from some systemic inflammation that's happening in my body. Um, more and more, there's research on diseases being linked to inflammation. So inflammation sort of being the root of many, many diseases. Some of the diseases that we see, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular health, neurological diseases, Alzheimer's, autoimmune diseases, arthritis, pulmonary diseases. And this is not all of them, but it's a pretty good sample diseases that are linked to inflammation. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. I feel like I'm talking really loud, but I just wanted to check in. Um, so when we talk about the root of inflammation, and this is, I think this is the root of a lot of things that are happening in our body, the root of diseases, we look at the gut. Okay, and you may have heard of the gut talked about as the second brain, a place where our neurotransmitters are developing, um, but there's a big correlation between what happens in our gut, what happens in our brains, and what happens in the rest of our bodies. So when we look at the digestive lining of our gut, it's not just about this food makes us sick, this food makes us well. It's about what's happening in our digestive systems. So if you've heard of leaky gut, and intestinal permeability. What happens is in our guts we have the lining that should be re woven really, really tightly and food particles should not get through that. When they do, un any undigested nutrient particles, toxins or bacterias, the, it can trigger the immune system and that leads to inflammation in the body. So one way I like to describe it is it's not just unhealthy foods, it's not just foods that you have an allergy to. It can be healthy foods that are not properly chewed, not properly digested, that can enter the bloodstream. You could have a carrot. I like to use this as an example. I think everybody thinks of a carrot as a health food, okay? You eat a carrot, you don't completely digest it, you have a chunk of a carrot. Your gut lining is not working to, as well as it should be. It's not woven as tightly as it could be and the chunk of the carrot goes into your bloodstream and then your body says, ooh, we have a foreign invader in here, let's attack this, okay? But it's a carrot, it's not a hostess cupcake, but it's still causing a problem in your immune system. Okay, so you might notice that I'm not just starting off with the 10 inflammatory food, anti-inflammatory foods that are gonna change your life. I'm really looking at this as a whole system about the way that we interact with food and how we um, uh, interact with the health of our bodies. So we look at the gut and we're going to talk tonight about a lot of foods that are um, supportive for gut health, starting just with a couple of things. You may have 
maybe you have or have not talked to somebody about doing an elimination diet. I know that's a, another big topic out there. A lot of people are doing elimination diets, trying to figure out what they're allergic to, what supports them the best. So some of the common inflammatory foods that activate the immune system that people tend to eliminate when they go on the elimination diet would be gluten, dairy, sugar, and alcohol. And those are sort of the big ones. And then you can look at, for some people, eggs, nuts, nightshades, you know, it kind of gets into the, <laughs> you can start listing every food group. But these are the ones that we kind of start with, um, if you haven't already started that. Um, for gut health, proper nutrients. So a lot of it is not about what are you going to take out of your diet, but thinking about what are you eating that's actually giving you nutrients. So we talk about a nutrient-dense diet. Uh, vegetables and meats and fruits and things that actually have nutrients in them versus chips and donuts and uh, hot dog buns and things that people just eat that don't have a lot of nutrients. They taste good, but they don't. Um, probiotics. So people take probiotics in the form of supplements or they take probiotics that come in food, kimchi, sauerkraut, fermented foods. There's lots of ways to get probiotics through food without taking supplements. Um, L-glutamine is a supplement that heals the lining of the digestive tract. So when I was talking about the per intestinal perme permeability and having that be really, really tightly woven, L-glutamine is something that can help with that. Fish oil, flax oil, or it's a really good omega-3 source. Omega-3 is awesome anti-inflammatory supplement. And we'll talk about later that you can also get in fish and other food. You don't have to just take it in supplement form. And vitamin D. Vitamin D, again, I know it's kind of hot in the news right now, but vitamin D actually works as a hormone in the body that regulates calcium absorption and inflammation levels. So if your vitamin D levels are low and it's recommended that you take vitamin D, that's going to be great for your um, inflammatory responses as well. So mindful eating. Anybody that's ever come to see me, I like to ask the question, how well do you chew your food? Nine out of 10 people say, I don't know, I eat my food fast. I eat it on the go, I have kids, I eat it at work. Um, I don't really pay that much attention to it. Some people say, I chew really slowly, I'm always the, the slowest person at the table and people comment on how I eat. Um, that's where I kind of want us all to be because when we sort of backpedal and think of the foundation of health, I want you to think for a minute. Just, I'm not gonna call anybody out. Just close your eyes or don't and think about the last meal you had. Think about where you ate it and think about how fast you ate it. All right, <laughs> okay. So, chewing food really, really well can aid in the digestive process and make nutrients more available. This is gonna help with inflammation because of what I was talking about earlier. If you don't have food particles that are going into your bloodstream, you have less likely that you're gonna have an immune response to the food that you're eating. So in some ways, it's very elementary. I say to people, I don't care if you're eating a donut. I do, don't eat a donut. But, or a piece of kale, I want you to totally chew it until it's like, sort of liquid. I mean, you don't need to get excessive about it, but that way you're gonna get the most nutrients out of it. It's gonna be the most digestible to your body. It's gonna reduce bloating, um, help with weight loss if that's something that you're looking to do. Um, when, you know when you get really tired after a meal? Some people do, not everybody, but you get the afternoon slump. A lot of times that's because all your energy is going into digestion. So if you supported yourself more, you might find yourself having um, remarkable energy at 1.30 in the afternoon, who knows? Um, so in the slides, I said earlier, for those of you that just came in, uh, I'll be emailing the slides out to you. So I put a bunch of stuff in here that I'm not gonna read everything on, but this is some tools for practicing mindful eating. So just the, the overall emphasis is to pay attention to what, why, how you're eating, to have, um, to chew, chew, chew. I cannot say that too many times. I'll probably say it a few more times tonight. Um, and just to think about the intention that you put into your food and into the way that you're nourishing your body. This is a mindful eating plate from Dr. Susan Albers that's on the internet that I just like as a visual so you can, you can check it out. Okay, so now we're gonna get to, to the meat of it, sort of. So pro-inflammatory foods. 
people familiar when I say the SAD diet? No? Okay. It's great. It stands for the standard American diet. <laughs> and I mean, not to pick on Americans, some of my favorite people are Americans, but our diet is really awful if you look at our diet as a society, okay? Even, even some of us that are like, we eat really healthy foods, we're eating a lot of healthy junk foods. We're eating a lot of processed foods. We're eating, um, you know, pizzas and hot dogs and chips and foods that are pretty much devoid of nutrients. And so it's causing a lot of health problems. We look at refined and processed food, grain-fed meats and eggs, and all of these I'm going to go into more detail. So if I say something and you're not sure what I'm talking about, hold on, I'll get there. Um, sugars, overconsumption of whole grains or consumption of refined grains, inflammatory fats, and those include our, we like to call them the unhealthy fats, which would be canola oil, soy oil, corn oil. These oils all have a really high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And omega-3 is what we're going for. We want omega-3s for our um, anti-inflammatory oils. And omega-6s, we do need omega-6 oils, and we get that plenty of them. But we don't need more omega-6s than we need omega-3s. It should be like a 3 to 1 ratio. Sodas and alcohol, and I can put any sugary drink in there. So we look at fruit juice, sodas, all these vitamin waters, um, Gatorades, all of those drinks that just if you turn them around and read them, you're drinking sugar. So we put that all, all in that category. Artificial sweeteners, so we look at Diet Coke, we look at gums that have artificial sweeteners, and anything that is artificially sweetened or sweetened with a chemical. Additives, food dyes, anything that's added to our processed food system. And it's really, really hard. I could do, label reading is a whole entire another class, which I love to do as well. But even on healthy food items, the ingredient lists are huge. And there's all these additives. And they're really smart about the names now that they use, because they know what people are looking for to not have. So they've replaced them with different names. Uh, and then so I put anything your body may not recognize as a food. So if you think about vegetables that are sprayed with chemicals, if you're buying non-organic food, you're having a chemical that your body does not recognize. If you're having anything that's an artificial sweetener, your body does not recognize that. So basically anything that doesn't grow <laughs> in the ground, your body does not recognize as a food. Therefore, we go back to the immune system attacking it because you've got a chemical in your body that's not a food, doesn't know what to do with it, gets nervous, attacks it. Hydration. Might seem like a weird segue, but hydration is optimal for fighting inflammation. Most people are slightly dehydrated. The formula for, for hydration is you take your body weight and you half it and then you want to have that much water per day, okay, spread out throughout the day. You don't want to gulp water bottles. You want to drink it all throughout the day so your cells are absorbing it. Um, some signs of dehydration. Again, we can play this game if you ever feel this way. Fatigue, foggy thinking, depression, joint pain, hunger, cravings, weight gain. Um, all of those things are things that you could, could look to for dehydration. You know, think about it. A lot of times I tell people when they're really tired, or if you feel really tired or you feel really hungry, if you're not, I mean, you may actually be hungry, but try water first, because sometimes that um, is actually what your body wants. It's not the food. This is just a hydration chart. You can't probably see that good right now, but you can see it when I email out the slides, and it just kind of gives you an idea of all the things that everybody knows that water is good for you, right? You have this idea, you need water, but it goes into a little de more detail about what it's doing all throughout your body. Sugar. I love sugar. Um, I think that sugar is probably the biggest elephant in the room when we look at health problems and we look at inflammation. And sugar is really hard. Just to be clear, it is an addiction. So if you're like, it's very hard to give up sugar, it is. Your dopamine receptors love sugar. Um, and it's very detrimental to our systems. We consume so much sugar that right now that it alters the hormone insulin. And if you know anything about insulin, you know that insulin is the fat storage hormone. So if you have too much sugar, 
and you are not super active and you're not going to go work that off, it's most likely going to store it as fat for you to use later on. We live in a society where we have sugar all the time, so later on never really comes. So when I look at sugars, I have people tell me all the time, and it's, it's very normal, very human, oh, I don't eat sugar, I just eat honey and molasses and fruit and this and that. And I'm not, if you say that, I'm, that's not in any way to make fun of somebody that says that. That's, that's a really kind of a misnomer that people think that those aren't sugars. Metabolically, anything that contains sugar, honey, molasses, fruit, table sugar, it's all the same in your body. The difference is honey, molasses, fruit also have other nutrients. So when you have those sugars, you have other nutrients, you're getting some other nutrients, you have a way to help process that sugar, it slows down the way that it reacts in your body. So yes, those are better sugars, but it's still sugar in your system. And when you're looking at diabetes, inflammation, blood sugar issues, in all of those sugars across the board need to be addressed, even fruit. And we'll go into a little bit later what fruits are, are better and how to, how to kind of incorporate fruit in moderation in your diet. I'll come back to sugar in a little bit. Now we're going to go to a positive twist on some starting to look at what is the anti-inflammatory diet. And if you've done any research on this, there's, you know, you can, you can type it in the internet and you get the 14 best foods for anti-inflammation, the 14 foods that are going to kill you, the this and that, you know, and there's so much information out there. And the way that I want to look at it is this is not a diet. It's not a short-term fix. It's a way that you change your lifestyle and your dietary patterns to eat foods that support your optimal health. So the reason I put on there avoid superfood and nutrient isolation, it's not that I don't think superfoods are great. They're fine. You know, if you have a lot of money and you want to buy $14 raw cacao and $14 goji berries and this and that, you can do that. And that's great. And those are all very supportive. But it's not one food or one group of foods that is going to fight this inflammation problem. It's the whole, it's looking at the whole panel of foods that you eat. So, and the nutrient isolation, same thing. It's not, it's not just that you have a lack of vitamin C. It's a, that we have a lack of nutrients across the board. So I really want people to sort of look at that instead of isolating one or two things that are going to fix the problem. So here's the diet. This is really easy. Everybody ready? This is the secret. It's just real whole foods that exist in nature, no, not chemically altered in any way, shape, or form. If you put only those, if you are a generally healthy person and you put those foods into your body, you can change the course of your health starting tomorrow. Okay? That being said, I know that there's people who have allergies to specific foods and reasons they can't have specific foods. That, that's just sort of a, uh, foundation starting point to get all the other foods out anything that comes in a box that you don't recognize that you would not be able to make at home because you would never know where that ingredient comes from you say goodbye to that okay I know that's I know that's not realistic we're human and we live in this this really complicated society but the reason I say it's the easy secret is because if you really just did that it is a lot easier than some than trying to figure out what's the right diet what's the right thing to be doing you know? So that being said, then the 85-15 or the 90-10 way of eating, is anybody familiar with that? So if, you, if you're eating well 85 to 90 percent of the time, then the 10, 15 percent of the time that, you know, you go home and your family's like, why don't you be fun and eat Papa John's, you know? <laughs> <You'll> <laughs> Not that anybody would say that, but um, then if you do that, then you're going to be okay. You're setting yourself up for this you know, for this health that can support that. But because we don't live in a way that we do that, it can be really, really challenging for our bodies to take these nutrient devoid foods. Okay. So some, some more down kind of the list of anti-inflammatory foods. We look at a plant-based whole foods diet. When I, say, when I use the word plant-based, it does not mean that you cannot eat meat. What it means is that most of what you eat is going to come from plants. And that's across the board. If, I, don't, I don't care if you want to be vegan or if you want to be paleo or you want to be vegetarian, whatever you want to be, the majority of your food should come from plants. 
because that's where the majority of our micronutrients come, for, come from. So we look at vegetables, we look at fruits, we look at nuts and seeds, meats and eggs, healthy fats, water, spices and herbs, herbal teas, whole grains. I don't know why I put spices on there again, just in case you didn't see it three times ago. Um, <laughs> mushrooms. Um, and then I put down there antioxidants and phytonutrients because these are the big things that we're looking at when we're fighting inflammation and what comes from vegetables and fruits are antioxidants and phytonutrients. It's, it's nature, nature made it that way. It's really amazing. So some more um, anti-inflammatory diet options. Uh, so, so in general, what I've been talking about, this anti-inflammatory diet will support your body. The way that it's doing that is providing you with all the vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, dietary fiber, antioxidants, phytonutrients that your body needs. It's going to stabilize your blood sugar and just make everything work properly. It's not intended as a weight loss necessarily. But people, if you get on this and weight loss is one of your goals, you will lose weight by doing this diet, this way of living. Um, and then I just like to think about, this goes back to mindful eating, just choosing and preparing your foods based on how those foods are going to support your optimal health instead of just like this candy bar looks real good and I'm hungry, you know, thinking about the long term of that choice. And eating to thrive, not survive, okay? So we're all surviving. You can live on the standard American diet. Lots of people do. They live for a really long time. People can live till they're 90, 95, 100. But you can really, really thrive and feel really, really good if you eat this way. Proteins. So we look at meat. And when we look at meat, we want to really look at the quality. So that's a lot of the information that's out there right now is you can't eat meat because it causes cancer. You can't eat meat because it causes inflammation. You can't eat meat because it causes this or that. What's left out of the picture is the quality of meat. What's added to the meat, how the meat is raised. Um, so we look at orga organic, grass-fed, hormone-free, and antibiotic-free. Okay, those are really, really important. Really important. I cannot stress that enough. If you're going to buy meat that has hormones and antibiotics in it, I know that that's cheaper it's, it's, and it's more available, but you eat those antibiotics, you eat those hormones, you eat everything that is fed to that animal goes into your body. So not to be gross, but let's be a little gross. So, um, so if that's like, well, this way of eating is really expensive, then you cut back on the amount of meat that you have and have it as sort of a luxury item. Have it every now and then. Have it, you know, instead of something that you have three times a day. Um, so we look at bison, beef, chicken, duck, lamb, turkey, venison, elk, eggs, um, pastured eggs are the best kind. So the, the image that I have up here, and if you've ever had an egg from, you know, you, ha you could have an egg from your neighbor's chicken, that's going to probably, probably be your best one. You get this yolk that's just amazing, yellow, beautiful. And then if you've had an egg that you buy from Eglin's Best. Sorry if anybody owns that company in here. But, um, <laughs> or, you know, an egg like that that's just kind of a standard American egg that you get at the Ingalls. It's going to be white. It's going to be really yellowy white. You know, you've seen the difference between those two eggs. And what you're looking at is the difference in the, nu in the nutrient levels there. So you're looking at the differences in vitamin D, the differences in choline, the differences in omega 3s. Um, so are eggs good for you? Yes and no. If you get an egg that is grain-fed, that doesn't have any omega-3s that, from the grocery store, the, your kind of standard American egg, no, an egg is not good for you. If you get an egg that is pastured, that has all the omega-3s and all the nutrients in it, then yes, an egg can be good for you if you don't have an egg allergy. So that's something to kind of look at. And then we look at soy, the soy tempeh issue. For what I usually recommend for people is Soy is okay, not in the form of soy milk and processed soy products, but in terms of looking at fermented soy, tempeh, um, sprouted tofu can be an option that can be more digestible, but staying away from the more processed soys. This is a chart, again, you probably can't see it right now unless you have amazing eyes, but for your reference for later on, it's just kind of a neat chart about the grass-fed beef versus um, uh, grain-fed beef industry, some little facts. Proteins, again. Okay, so we look at fish. So fish, sort of the same as meat, 
Um, you want to look at getting wild caught. So you can see the difference. And if you've ever looked at the supermarket, you can really tell the difference between fish. Also, fish should not smell really like fish. If it smells really fishy, it's not, don't eat it. Okay? And it's fine. You can ask that. They love it. Just ask the people who are selling the fish if you can smell it. Um, but so you want to look for the wild. Farmed fish are, are often fed corn, fed other things that fish don't eat. And so, you know, and they're given antibiotics. All, the whole, the whole, the same issue. So those are some fish that you can have for proteins. Um, and this is all written out for you. So hopefully it's, it's kind of a long list. I don't need to go through everything, but so you'll have it as reference. So dairy, dairy is another hot topic. I put dairy and dairy products up there. People always ask me if dairy is good for you, and my, my answer is, are you a cow? And if the answer is no, then you don't necessarily need dairy. But the truth is, if you want to eat dairy, because some people do, and I get that, um, there are some ways that dairy can be supportive and have nutrients in it. The best way to have it is to have raw dairy. The reason for that is it hasn't been heated up, it hasn't lost its enzymes or all the nutrients. The milk that you buy from the store that's pasteurized and homogenized, it doesn't have anything left in it. There's, n there's not nutrients necessarily in that, maybe a few. But if you're really looking to get nutrients out of milk, raw milk. Um, almond milk unsweetened, coconut milk unsweetened. And I say this later on when, when I look at the label reading, but the best way to do this is to, to, to make it at home honestly. And I can, I can talk through that after this. But, um, because a lot of the almond milks and coconut milks, they have a lot of additives added to them, carrageenan and soy lecithin and this and that, that we're just, you know, again, not sure about. They're not real foods. Um, so we look at goat cheese, goat yogurt, sheep cheese, sheep yogurt. The reason for that is goats and sheep have different enzymes and different protein structure than cow's milk does. So sometimes, not for everybody, if you can't tolerate cow's milk, you can tolerate goat's milk. So I tell people to just, you know, give it a try, see if it works for you. It may not. Um, and then there, this, this is just a little informational list about the differences of raw milk versus, uh, proce versus processed milk, if you're interested in that. So carbohydrates. So I kind of do this on purpose. You might think, this isn't carbohydrates, this is vegetables. Yeah, but here's what happens. Vegetables are carbohydrates. It's true. So all the vegetables here, again, I don't need to go through the list, but what I want to tell you is vegetables. Here's, the, here's an easy way to think about it. Vegetables that are free for you to eat, they cost money, but I mean you can eat, is think about anything that grows above the ground, okay, is great. It's lower on the glycemic index, that means it's going to mess less with your blood sugar levels, and those have the most nutrients. Okay, so the ones that we look at eating in moderation would be the ones that grow underneath the ground, which are sweet potatoes, white potatoes, turnips, beets, parsnips. There are a couple of exceptions. Garlic grows underground, radishes grow underground. So there's a, a, little, you know, a little bit of play there, but it's just sort of a way to, to kind of remember it. Above ground, you're good. Below ground, in moderation. They still have nutrients, they just have higher sugar levels. So other carbohydrates we look at, whole grains in moderation, whole grain products instead of whole wheat. So if you have bread that is whole wheat, that is still pretty processed, does not mean that the whole grain is involved. So you want the whole grain so you're getting all of the nutrients, the fiber. When you get just a white rice, all you're getting is the starch. You're not getting all the other nutrients. Brown rice, wild rice, beans would be a protein and a carb, and then whole oats. And in a little bit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address the grain issue because I know there's a lot of talk about grains and inflammation, and I'm going to sort of I'm going to help with that in a minute. Uh, carbohydrates again, so we go with fruits. So earlier I talked about fruits, and fruits are great. Don't get me wrong; fruits have nutrients in them, um, and there's not a lot in fruits that you can't get from vegetables. So when we say it's sort of the regular dietary guidelines or make sure that you get a lot of fruits and vegetables. Make sure you get nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day. I like to flip flop that. Make sure you get a lot of vegetables and a little bit of fruit. Fruit should be your treat. Fruit shouldn't be something you're striving for nine servings of a day. You're good. 
Um, so when we, we talk about, and I have reference on here for what the glycemic index is, but I'm, I'm talking about foods that are low on the glycemic index or high on the glycemic index, and that's the way that it affects your blood sugar. So we recommend having fu fruits that are lower on the glycemic index be the fruits that you primarily eat. So we look at apples, berries, oranges, pears, lemons, limes. And then the other fruits are higher on the glycemic index, and so you want to have those in moderation realize that those are pretty high in sugar. And those are a lot of the delicious fruits, peaches, watermelons, things that you might not think of being really sugary. But and so on here I have um, also something about the dirty dozen list. So I know that it's not necessarily reasonable to say you can buy everything organic. So every year the environmental working group puts out a list of the things that are the most important to buy organic. That means they're the, going to be the least sprayed or the least amount of it permeates into the food. So you can check that out for 2017 and look up the ones that are the most important to have organic. So we look at healthy fats. Uh, this is my, one of my favorite food cartoons. If you can't read it, it said, I said you're the good kind of fat. Um, he's crying. Um, so, uh, you know, just there's a lot of talk about fats too and what do fats do to you and fats make you fat and fats cause this and fats cause that, but we really want to separate what's a healthy fat and what's an unhealthy fat. So we look at nuts and seeds, avocados, olives, hemp seeds, chia seeds, all of those. And you'll notice that I don't have um, peanuts on there. Peanuts are not a nut, peanuts are a legume. And I don't typically recommend that people eat peanuts for their nutritional value. If you like peanuts, it's fine. Get organic, you can eat them. But I promote these other ones before peanut butter. So healthy fats. So it's really best if you've seen one of the documentaries, like you've seen Forks Over Knives or you've seen Plant Based Nation, and they say, do not use any oil in your food. Do not cook with oil. Only eat plants, you know. So what they're talking about is, does kind of make sense. It's like get your healthy fats from, from actual food. So that would mean eating an avocado, eating nuts and seeds, eating olives, eating coconuts. You know, it sort of goes back to the whole food concept. The problem with getting healthy fats is that you really have to pay attention to the quality when you're getting olive oil, you're getting coconut oil, you're getting these other oils that you cook with. Because you can go, you can go to Ingalls and you can get Laura Lynn coconut oil that's refined and is $4 a bottle and that is not an oil that is going to be good for your body in any way, shape or form. Okay? But you can go and get a whole coconut and eat that and that's going to be great for you. Okay? So you really have to pay attention to the quality of oils that you get if you're not eating it from a whole food. Is there, sorry, now I'm kind of, I'm trying to just keep on the time frame, so I'm kind of going through quickly. If there's something somebody wants me to touch on more, I will. Um, herbs and spices. I think these are really, really great to think about in terms of using in your food. You know, you may use a little bit, but to, to think about how you flavor your food, how you give, you know, we're used to foods being really sweet and salty and having all this kind of artificial flavor added to them, but real herbs and spices are amazing and underused. The ones that I have written really big, or kind of big comparatively, are ones that are kind of known more to fight inflammation. So we see chili peppers, the capsaicin in the chili peppers, cloves, garlic, rosemary, and I'm sure, or maybe you haven't heard, but turmeric is kind of a big buzzword one. And it is, it is really great, the curcumin and turmeric um, I, I mean, I recommend to people take turmeric like they would take aspirin because it does the same type of thing, but it doesn't give, it doesn't give you the negative um, consequences for your stomach. So condiments, we look at apple cider vinegar, guacamole. I love guacamole. just like to put that in there. Um, hummus, mustard, mayonnaise. I, I am concerned about mayonnaise. So mayonnaise in and of itself is not a bad product. It's eggs and olive oil and it's, it's fine. Eat mayonnaise. Mayonnaise that, you, that they sell at the store, it is really hard to find a mayonnaise that doesn't have canola oil, soybean oil, um, some other kind of oil that you don't want to be eating. So if you're going to buy mayonnaise, that's fine, but look for it with organic olive oil only. Or make it at home. It's fun. It's not that easy, but it's fun. <laughs> Do 
Well, there is, I, I, I sort of don't like to recommend this brand because it's so expensive, but it's called Primal Kitchen. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, and they haven't, it's an avocado mayonnaise, but it just has avocado. I don't have avocado in everything, but it just happens to have it in there. Um, and it's, it's great. Dukes is not. Dukes would be in the. Uh, I know, I, and I have lost some friends and family members over this argument because I know that Duke's mayonnaise is the mayonnaise of the South, but I also, right. just because we're here for health, <laughs> I gotta say Duke's, Duke's is not cutting it. But it's good, but it tastes good. It's better than Hellman's. It might be better than Hellman's. Yeah, the label's, the, label's, the label's better, yeah. And Hellman's, most of Hellman's is you turn it around and it's soybean oil or canola oil for the first ingredient. And, sh and sugar, because everybody likes soybean oil and high fructose corn syrup on their burgers. I mean, that's just weird, right? I mean, it tastes good, but when you think about it and you break down what's in the product, that's disgusting. But, it's, but it tastes good all put together. Um, so it, beverages, so what can you drink? Um, water, filtered water would be the best. Spa water, I like to call it, because you can make water fun. Put lemon, put lime in it, put um, little bits of fruit in it, you know, put mint, put um, some of the herbs in it and make it, make it something that you enjoy drinking. Um, broths. So homemade bone broth, veggie broth, that makes a great um, sort of herbal tea alternative. Uh, almond, cashew, uh, nut milks, uh, organic low acid coffee. So another thing people always ask me, is coffee good for you? Does coffee cause inflammation? Does coffee cause this, that, the other? Coffee's like everything else. There is a way that you can have it that um, is, would be a better choice. For some people, coffee is not a good choice. If it makes you anxious, if it keeps you awake, if it does cause inflammation, give it up. But if you really love coffee, so a way to have low acid coffee is a couple of ways. A French press makes it lower acid. An AeroPress makes it lower acid, if you've heard of an AeroPress. But cold brew is actually the best way to make uh, low acid coffee. And you can, you can go buy one of those fancy cold brew machines or you can just take some beans, grind them up, put them in a mason jar, fill it up with, co with cold water, soak it for 24 hours, and then strain it. You know, so either way. But, that, but cold press is a good low acid way to drink coffee. Herbal teas, uh, kombucha, raw vegetable juices. Be careful with any vegetable juices. A lot of the vegetable juices that you just buy also have a lot of fruit juice, so you can get you know, you can get one of those vegetable juices that's a serving. This'll, it'll be this big, it's two servings, and it's 42 grams of sugar per serving. So you, you've got to watch that, you know, if you're buying it out. But if you make it at home, you're good. Sparkling water, unsweetened, and then green tea um, has a lot of anti-inflammatory compounds. Why do you say in moderation on the sparkling water? Oh, that's, thanks for bringing that up. Because I think that um, sparkling water is fine. There's often things added to sparkling water, natural flavors. Um, if you make your own if you, water. And if you make your own sparkling water. So there is some research on sparkling water, like um, taking away calcium and phosphate and some other things that you need from your bones. And I'm not an expert on that, but I've sort of started to uh, recommend that people, sure, have sparkling water, but have it as a treat. Don't have it as the, your hydration for the day. Like caffeinated tea? Yeah. Um, that's fine. Uh, you want to pay attention to the quality of it, organic tea, and know that that, just like coffee, doesn't count as hydration. Okay. So make sure that you're getting your. Doesn't decaf count as hydration? So technically, no on both of those, on decaf or on caffeinated coffee and caffeinated tea. Um, they technically dehydrate you. So have a cup of water when you're having those, even though they're made with water. but. So is Coca-Cola. I mean, you know, these things are made with water, but they don't necessarily hydrate you. Okay, sweeteners and treats. So, sure, people are going to use sugar. I understand it's not going to, you know, there's very few people who can just say, I'm not going to have sugar. Um, so thinking about, we talked earlier about honey or molasses. I want to address the agave issue. So agave is just sugar. Agave has the same thing sort of as like high fructose corn syrup does in the way that it affects your blood sugar. Sure, if you went and you got an agave plant and you just opened it up and you took some agave out of it, then that would probably be a better source, but that's not how agave is processed. 
So just, just saying that. Honey or molasses, local honey is the best if you're looking for, especially for like allergy support. Stevia, um, dark chocolate, and I don't just say that because I love dark chocolate, but if you go 72% or higher, um, the chocolate, the cocoa actually has some anti-inflammatory properties, but you want to make sure that you're not getting a ton of sugar. And then, you know, just having a couple of squares of it. Um, and then I put, I put dry wine and dry cider on there because always when I'm talking to people, they say, okay, I, I know I'm not supposed to, have, supposed to have alcohol, but I'm gonna have some alcohol. So which one should I have? So if you were going to do this, then the dry wine or dry cider would be the best because those are the ones that are not gonna have sugar added to them and it's gonna be mostly the fermented apple, the fermented grapes. I'm not promoting drinking alcohol, I'm just noticing, knowing that people might want to, to, to know the answer to what if. What's that? Coconut sugar. Coconut sugar. Um, so it, coconut sugar would still be in the sugar camp of, yeah, I could probably put that on as a healthy, um, in moderation sugar. I should add that, thank you. Yeah. I, actually, technically, I should put maple syrup on there too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I messed that slide up. Yeah, so I guess if you think of any of those sort of non-processed sugars, that would work. And you could substitute that in there. The one that doesn't work is brown sugar, because brown sugar is white sugar that has molasses added back to it. There's, the brown sugar is, was an amazing marketing tool by some company, because everybody I know is like, yeah, but I, you can eat this. I made it with brown sugar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's sugar. It's just sugar, but it has some, some molasses added back into it. So, so cooking methods. So I like to talk about this because like before, we're not just talking about what we're eating, we're talking about how we prepare it. So you've probably heard about how you're not supposed to have grilled meat and you're not supposed to have things that are cooked on too high of a temperature. And what happens is if you um, grill something, you get something called the AGE. So it's just advanced glycation end products. And basically, it changes the protein and fat structure of the meat. So there are some ways around that. So high levels of that are supposed to contribute to inflammation, and we don't want that. So if you are going to grill, marinate the meat ahead of time, because liquid tends to um, stop the development of AGEs. It may not totally eliminate it, but make it lower. And um, slow and low when you're doing meat stewing, poaching, braising, um, and like I said, marinating. So those are some, some ways to kind of get around that. Yeah, so same thing can happen with vegetables. But the, yeah, you don't really want to do that. I would say with the vegetables, so you know how you get the chard? Try to not get the chard. I know, it's so good. I know, I know, I ruined everything. But, <laughs> but, but, you know, try for that. And, just try for it in moderate. Like, okay, you have grilled vegetables every now and then. That's okay. So vegetables produce less AGs than meat do. So. What did you say? AGE is oh, glycation. Glycation end product. About steaming or steaming vegetables. Yeah, steaming vegetables is a good way to go. Yeah. Okay, so we talk about beans. I'm gonna talk about beans and grains for a minute because there's a lot of buzz about I can't have beans or I can't have grains or this or that. There are certain reasons why I recommend people don't have beans or don't have grains. Um, if you are on a strict weight loss program, it can help you to take out beans and it can help you to take out grains because they're starchy and that's for a short-term fix. You wanna lose some weight, it will help. Science, that's it. But if you're just looking for an overall healthy diet, beans can be a good protein, a good part of that. Um, what you want to do in a perfect world is soak the beans, okay? Then you know how people say, I can't eat beans because I get, you know, little flatulent. Um, if you soak, them, then, and you soak them and then you change the water to cook them in, okay? So when you soak them, you get rid of the phytic acid, you get rid of the lectins, and you get rid of the enzyme inhibitors. And those are all of the reasons that you're not supposed to eat beans, okay? And besides the fact that they're starchy, but the starchiness you just do, and you eat them in moderation. Okay, so these are some ways that cooking beans can um, be, make, make it more digestible and better for you if you enjoy eating beans. Grains, same thing. So there's the paleo diet. There's the don't eat grains. The grains are terrible for you, what, what not. So when you look at a refined grain, yes, 
a refined grain can cause the same inflammatory response as sugar. Okay, so that's, we're looking at white rice, we're looking at breads, we're looking at pastas, we're looking at those kind of refined grains. But having a whole grain, same thing, you can do it like you do the beans, you can soak your grains and then cook them, that's gonna be your optimal way, soak them, change the water, cook them. You don't have to do that, but that's gonna be your optimal nutrition. Um, so here's the thing about grains. We eat too many of them. So too many grains means that you're not eating micronutrients from other foods. So when you look at your plate, like I said earlier, you want your plate to look mostly plants, little bits of grain, little bits of meat, okay? No matter what, always. So then can you have whole grains as part of a healthy diet? Yes. Can you have white bread as part of a healthy diet? No. Can you have pizza? I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. So, but I will say, so gluten, I mean, it's, it's all real things, okay? These are all real for people. You may eat grains, you may eat whole grains, and you feel awful, and you feel bloated, you soaked them, you did everything. That means it is not good for you, and that's okay. Don't have grains. Gluten, f for a lot of people, people, it, they have a really hard time with digesting gluten because they have a hard time with the protein, the body launches an immune response right when the protein goes into the body if you have an, a gluten allergy or a gluten sensitivity, okay? And then when that happens, then you have a malabsorption of other nutrients and it can really cause problems for people, okay? So that's, that's just sort of the, the skinny on gluten. But gluten is not in all grains. So if you go gluten-free, it doesn't mean you have to go whole grain-free. Okay, so talk a little bit about label reading real quick. So in a perfect world, like I said earlier, the perfect world, you're not going to read a label because everything just came out of the ground. It's a whole food. What would you need a label for? Okay. But realistically, you're going to need to read some labels. So some tricks. I don't care about what it says up at the top where it says fat, where it says calories, where it says, I do care about sugar. Um, all of those, sodium, all that, that's great, but that's not the only thing that you should look at on a label. Okay. You should look at the ingredient list and the, the ingredient list. The first three things in the ingredient list are primarily what's in that product, okay? Uh, organic does not mean healthy, okay? So you can get organic Newman's O's. That's great, that's probably better than an Oreo, but that's a cookie, that's a junk food. <laughs> and I know that seems, but I can't tell you the number of people that are like, well, you can eat that, it's organic. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so sugar amounts, if you don't know this, I think this is a fun game. So sugar is four grams equals one teaspoon. So without any judgment, just one day, you know, it's the dog days of summer, go through your, your, the food that you eat through the day and measure out the amount of sugar that you're eating that day. Just measure it in a jar, Look, read on the labels, four grams equals one teaspoon, just see how much you have. It's a fun game. Because um, processed food, there's, sh there's sugar in everything. I mean, the, the Rhythm Foods kale chips at Earth Fair have three grams of sugar per serving. It makes me crazy. <laughs> like, it's a kale chip. But, so, but anyway, um, so looking for sugar and then realizing that any word ending in O-S-E can also be sugar. They're very, very tricky with the ways they label sugar and how many times they label sugar in a product. Um, you want to look for the types of oils, look for any additives, look for, look for natural terms, because that's a big thing. Like, does anybody know what a natural flavor is? No. <laughs> just, just think about that. <laughs> um, there's a natural flavor factory somewhere. Um, and then there's different terms, like yeast ex extract is really similar to MSG in the body. So thinking about a lot of these natural products have uh, yeast extract in them. Yeast extract is yeah. MSG. Is MSG. Yeast um, yeah. And then I talk about heart healthy greenwashing because, and this is my favorite example, Campbell's soup. I mean, we, we've all eaten Campbell's soup our whole life. It used to be, it probably was tomatoes and water, whatever. Mm -hmm. But now they have heart healthy Campbell's soup, which, it, which is, I should have brought it, because it's tomato, the ingredients are tomatoes, high fructose corn syrup, soybean oil. Oh. And it's just, it's kind of amazing, because I'm like, soup, 
That's great. Anyway, so just really, I think, I think it's fun. You'll start to learn. Even products, go home tonight, look at stuff. You know, I'm not trying to shame anybody. Just look at your products and see what's in them because it's just it's pretty interesting what the industry is doing um, to us. So eating out. Okay, I like to bring this up. We live in Asheville. People like to eat out. We have a lot of really good restaurants here. Okay, so it doesn't have to be, you know what, we're going out to dinner. Forget about the anti-inflammatory diet. Let's do what we want, party time. You, I feel like, first of all, we make change by asking for things, by caring about what's in our food. Okay, as a, as a collective community, that's the only way that things change. Okay, so when you go to a restaurant, ask about the oil. Ask about the um, quality of the meat. Ask about the eggs. You know, you can do it in a really nice way where you just say, I always do like, I know this is kind of annoying, but um, just kind of care about what I put in my body. Do you mind telling me? And if they can't tell you, then they don't know. So it's a good indicator, don't have it. Probably came from Cisco, you know. Um, uh, oils in restaurants, even if you go to the best restaurant in Asheville, they most likely use canola oil, soybean oil, corn oil, uh, one of the big Wesson oils, because it's cheap. That's how, I mean, restaurants are trying to make money, they're not trying to make you healthy. Um, but then I say, so earlier I was like, pizza, forget it, you know. No, but I think that you can seek out restaurants that are really working. There are restaurants in Asheville that are working to help support the health of our community and individual health. And one, one example I can think of right now is in the River Arts District is All Souls. And sure, it's pizza. It's not a health food. But they use local grain from North Carolina. It's fermented. It's all the vegetables, everything is organic, grown right there in the garden. They, you know, so the quality, everybody's gonna go eat pizza tomorrow and say, I, I said you could do that. But, but honestly, so if you're gonna, you know, you're living, I know that we're living in this world and it's fun to do these things, so, so you have some choice in it and it doesn't have to be just forget about the diet. Or another thing I get is people say, well, I can't, I can't stay on this, I've got family coming to town. I can't stay on this, I'm traveling. I can't stay on this. So this whole thing is figuring out about how can you stay on this every day? And for the most part, you know, for your 85, 90%. So you can feel really good. So you can enjoy what you're doing. And go on vacation and don't, don't junk food load because you're on vacation so you can have a good time. Like eat really well and take care of yourself so you can have a good time. All right. So. In wrapping up, so I just did, this is just like a little thing that's kind of anti-inflammatory in a nutshell, and it's eating plant fat, fats, eating animal fats, eating low sugar fruits, eating non-starchy plants, properly raised animals, and non-caloric beverages. And of course, that's, you've got all the other list of foods that I said in there. And then I just have resources on the end here, so that goes through what the glycemic index is, the anti-inflammatory shopping list, which is broken down really nice so you could take it to the store with you, make sure you're doing the, doing the right thing, dirty dozen list. Um, and then the environmental working group also has just the general consumer information. It's really great. They talk about sunscreen and I mean just all kinds of products. So you can just get really informed on things that you're buying and how you can have a, an active say in what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That that is a really great question, and it, and it's it's challenging. And I think that I did sort of address this, and I'm like, just just do it, just eat these foods. But um, I think you go through uh, you go through withdrawal phase. You can use um, you know fruits as your sugar, even though I said like let's use fruits in moderation. That's something that you sort of say, okay, I'm not going to have this cookie. I'm going to have some fruit. Um, staying really hydrated. What I tell people is oftentimes people want to transition and they want to, um, when they're hungry, they're like, I don't know what to eat. I just kind of go hungry, you know? So I say, eat real food. When you have that craving, you have that intense sugar craving, make some real food. Make a salad, make some chicken, make some, you know, really feed yourself and nourish yourself. Um, it can be good just to make a plan and say you're not going to go all the way, you know? You're going to say, for this week, I'm going to practice um, you know, not buying three processed products and replace those with real whole food products. You know, if you're, it's sort of, and I'd be happy to talk with you more about it because it is really individualized seeing where you're coming from. And I think there is a way to do it where it's a transition and not just to get thrown in the pool. <laughs> yeah. What is the situation with salt? So, good question. 
Uh, what is the situation with salt? So, so salt, yeah, and, and, and here's the thing, and I know everybody's on their individual diet, so I don't want to overstep any boundaries, but sea salt, so iodine salt that we have, Morton sea salt, the salts that we have in processed foods, we have so much salt. If you were to take all that processed food out of your diet, sea salt is a good way to get the real, you need salt. Salt is one of the electrolytes we have to have sodium that you need. So in terms of if you are eating real whole foods, you need to have some salt and it's okay to have that salt. The problem, the big sodium issue, the reason why a lot of people can't have sodium is because our whole lives we've been having sodium in all the processed food products. Things that you wouldn't even think of. That's another fun thing to look on labels and see how much sodium is in things. It's kind of incredible. Um, even chicken, like in the standard American, like the way chicken is raised, they, they inject it with sodium to make it bigger. Um, sodium water, so people are getting sodium just like in chicken. You know. Does that, so if you're eating a whole foods diet, it's okay to have the sea salt. Where can you find raw milk? That's, that's a really good question. Um, so raw milk right now is labeled as pet food because it's illegal in North Carolina and South Carolina to sell it for human consumption. In, at the West Asheville tailgate market, yeah, they sell it. And they just put a little label that says for pet food, but it's not, you know. So I know they have it there. They do, they do yogurts. Did you know if they did cheese? They're expanding. I know they do yogurt and milk. Yeah. But, but they're starting to expand, so I think if you were like into it. Yeah. It's, it's okay to saute them, just on low heat. And, and really the best thing to do, honestly, is take your vegetables and saute them in a little bit of vegetable broth or a little bit of water. And then you can use a good quality oil for the flavoring. You can use the, you know, people just tend to like saute in all this oil and you don't need to do that. What's a good quality oil? What's that? What's a good quality oil? Okay, so you could use an olive oil, uh, uh, one of the nut oils, the avocado oil, the walnut oil, and those are ones you wouldn't want to cook with. That would be like a nice drizzling oil. But an, an, olive, an extra virgin olive oil would be really nice. Flax oil or fish oil is a nice too from a health perspective. It's not, fish oil is not delicious for like serving to your friends, but. How do you feel about washing vegetables and um, I think if you want to wash the vegetables to get like dirt off or to get the bugs off or whatever, that's fine. Washing, you can't really wash the chemicals completely off. So if you're getting non-organic vegetables, you can wash them, but it's not going to. Yeah. I mean, I, I like to rinse my vegetables, but mostly because they usually have dirt on them. <laughs> if you get them from the grocery store and they're not organic, they've probably already washed them or sprayed them in some, with something. With the thyroid issues, how does the anti-inflammatory affect that? Um, well, I think that, and certainly there's certain things that you can't have or that you've been recommended to not have, um, but, and in general, like eating this way does help to support your hormones and your thyroid. I mean, I know there are some certain things that I probably listed here that you would have to take out, mm -hmm. but then the other things that you would be free to eat. You know, you, you're supposed to take out, can you remind me of the things you're supposed to take out? Can you remind me of the things that you're not eating? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th those are mainly the things. So everything else you should be able to have and should be fine with. Could I don't want to say should, but <laughs> yeah. Are you supposed to have them that straw? Can you have them like roasted almonds? 